just a few more minutes. Okay, I want to be mindful of everybody's time, so let's begin. My name is Sue Brooks. I'm the Communications Manager at New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, formerly New Jersey Foundation for Aging. Very, very glad that you could join us this morning. A couple housekeeping notes. First of all, yes, we will be sharing a, this, a link to this recording. And yes, you will get the slides to this recording and any handouts that our speakers um, want to share, you'll be getting that information as well. So this is the uh, second in the webinar series of programs and innovations sponsored by Parker. And this one is housing and health innovations through integration and inspiration. And now I would like to introduce you to Steve Leone. He's the principal of Spiesel Architectural Group and he's NJAAW's board chair, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sue. Uh, great introduction. Looks like we've got quite a number of people on board today and very exciting. Glad to see you all attend. And I'm sure you will be um, very thrilled and, and happy about the conversation today. We have some excellent guests. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Parker Life for their continued support and for helping us put this webinar on. Uh, without the help of such great supporters, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the great work that we are all doing. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing the uh, person who will set the presentation moving forward, Margaret, uh, Margaret Fringen. Uh, apologize, Margaret, I'm having difficulty speaking today. Um, Margaret is Director of Marketing, Communications and Community Relations, uh, who joined Parker Health Group, Inc. 12 years ago, she is responsible for marketing and advertising of all Parker services and communications, including public relations, branding, website, social media, as well as community relations. I have the distinct pleasure of knowing, knowing Margaret across those 12 years as I have had a close relationship with Parker uh, in the work that I do um, in my day job. And uh, I can tell you that uh, there is no one better at uh, promoting uh, the mission of uh, making aging part of life, which is Parker's mission, better than Margaret. Um, Margaret is a consummate professional, is a graduate of Rutgers University, and uh, always keeps me on my toes. So I know she is uh, very uh, good at her job. So without further ado, Margaret. Thank you very much, um, Steve. And um, it's our pleasure to be a sponsor of NJAA organization, especially this very, very um, important uh, seminar and webinar series. So we are pleased to be part of this group. So I just would like to take you through a Parker mission vision and the services that we provide in right here in New Jersey. Uh, next. So uh, we have been established for over a century. Uh, actually, our first home was established on Eastern Avenue, if anybody's familiar with St. Peter's, in 1907. So we have been here as a, as a uh, you know, legacy home, and now we were a lot more. So we know that over the next 30 years, we are going to remain committed to um, changing the experience of aging in America for all of us. Next. Okay, so we make aging part of life is our vision. And our mission is discover ways to make aging manageable, relatable, and reaching for all of society. When we embark on this rebranding uh, after we became 110 years old, uh, we felt that um, our previous uh, previous century, you know, it, it really changed in the 21st century. 
And we feel so, so um, passionate about making aging part of life that we actually made that into our tagline. So some people refer to us Parker Life and uh, that is our website, but we are Parker Health Group Inc. Um, next. So one of the things I just wanna take you because we're always very, very grateful to our Henrietta uh, Parker who established this home, this little, little home in memory of her, of her beloved husband, Francis. And she has been a, um, we were calling her grandmother or mother of long-term care because it really, she was so passionate, dedicated her life uh, to actually uh, caring for those that really needed um, convalescent long-term care. And uh, the big thing is also she, as this seminar, she was actually an educator. She established uh, a nursing school right there in the home. So that, that has been a very, very important part of our mission as well, to be an education and thought leaders in, in the field. Next. So our services uh, from this little nursing home, as you can see, we have a full basket of services, starting with post-acute uh, rehabilitation after people are in a hospital, to, uh, to long-term care, assisted living, we specialize memory care, which has been uh, with us for, for the entire over 100 years. But we also have in this part, the common community services, which links really closely to, to the topic today. So adult day center, wellness center, rehab at home, which has been tremendously popular, especially during this pandemic, um, and also part navigator to helping people manage how they are transitioned through uh, the aging services. Next. So and, uh, we are person-directed, uh, person-centered care in all of our homes. So we have, these are our long-term care, nursing homes, the Landing Lane, which is the legacy home in New Brunswick River Road is our second home established in 1984. And that is in Piscataway Park at Somerset. It's one that we acquired five years ago uh, from, um, and used to be Park at McCarrick or McCarrick Care Center. And we built with actually with Steve help, um, six years ago, we built a small home model in Monroe. We're very proud of this. And, um, and in Somerset, we're very uh, excited to have a complete renovation and a new construction project, which we hope to be open in just a couple of months. Next. So the assisted living at Parker at Stonegate, again, a very, very unique. It's very tremendous amenities, um, very uh, wonderful dining services, and we have on-site 24-7 nursing, uh, nursing care. Our staff is uh, superb. Uh, we're very proud. At this point, we have all of our residents at 100% vaccinated, and we in phase two, so we have been able to um, to provide a lot of additional things that are during the pandemic were not possible. So assisted living is located in Highland Park next to the Piscataway campus. Next. Our post-acute rehab is five-star rated and we accept Medicare and Medicaid. Um, we specialize with all of the therapies, especially stroke, cardiac, pulmonary, and orthopedic rehab. And of course, right now, you know, we do have a specialized COVID um, wing as well. Next. Adult day centers have been amazed, amazingly, amazingly popular. We have um, both in Highland Park and Monroe Township, and we have the social program of specialized memory, and then a full day medical program, which is providing um, tremendous, before the pandemic last year at this time, well, right before the pandemic, we had over 160 people just in Highland Park and another uh, 50 people in Monroe Township that we were supporting. We, right now we have virtual programming. Next. 
And of course, the new program that we just launched right before the pandemic is the senior care coordination, which provides people with navigation. I believe that we all know that uh, aging process is, is challenging, not just for the person who's, uh, who's going through that journey, but also for the caregivers. So we provide a lot of support and, and resources to how to access the community programming. So that's a new program, very popular this, this year, especially. Next. And of course, the wellness program in Highland Park, including aquatic center, we have indoor swimming pool open six days a week, rehabilitative services, which are, which are for community, the rehab at home. We offer it Middlesex and Somerset County, and of course, the respite program at all of the residences. Next. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. And I look forward to being part of the next webinar. I'd like to introduce now to Elise Perwiller, um, who's going to uh, be our facilitator for the program. Elise. Thank you, Margaret. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for being with us today as we take you on our journey through housing and health from innovation through integration and inspiration. Uh, as uh, I also would like to thank uh, the uh, NJAAW and Parker Health Group for inviting myself and my two partners uh, to present today uh, because we're uh, anxious to share with you some of the work we've been doing. Next, please. Uh, I'm gonna present a little overview so you have an idea of where we're going. And uh, we're going to discuss a collaborative project that was funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration called the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. And that particular program links housing, health, community and academic partners to support aging in place and interprofessional education in affordable housing. I'm actually going to be joined by two of my uh, partners uh, in, uh, uh, Conceiving of this idea, uh, Maria DiMaggio, who's going to describe the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency, who's our state partner. Uh, Marilyn Mock from Fair Share Support Services, who's our community-based partner. And I will be presenting on behalf of Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. We are the academic partner. Uh, we're also going to be explaining the relationship between age-friendly health systems and the 4Ms framework that supports aging in place and interprofessional education and training. And we're also going to share some preliminary outcomes and lessons learned in taking a project from uh, integration and inspiration to innovation in affordable housing and interprofessional education. Next. Uh, now I would like to introduce Maria DiMaggio, who's uh, a social service administrator in the Division of Tax Credits at New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. Maria. Thank you, Elise. Good morning, everyone. We're very happy to be here. Um, very pleased to be part of this whole initiative that we will be discussing today. And we're also very pleased um, and with being asked to be on this panel by um, NJAAW, um, we have partnered with um, the New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well for the past 20 years, and um, we, we've had a very successful partnership. So thank you so much for inviting us, and thank you, Margaret, for being a sponsor of this innovation series. I'm going to be, as as Elise said, I'm the social services administrator for New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency. And we are a state agency. Next, please. Um, we are a state agency that provides funding for affordable home ownership and rental opportunities for New Jersey residents. We do that in a variety of ways. One is that we fund affordable home mortgages for first time home buyers. We also fund construction and rehabilitation of affordable rental housing through um, our multifamily financing and our low income tax credit program. In the agency, we through all our staff members and divisions, we currently monitor over 800 properties in both senior and family developments. And that represents approximately 60,000 individuals. And we, we, we are home to more than 60,000 individuals. Next. 
So in what ways can a state agency or a government agency provide services or link services for their residents? And there are two ways that New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency does this. One is through the Services for Independent Living Program or the SIL program. And the other is through our Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Next. Um, the SIL program, the Services for Independent Living Program, was established at New Jersey Housing for Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant in 1988. We um, began with 15 pilot sites, and by pilot sites, there, there, are, our, we, there are our senior buildings, and um, now we're currently in over 110 buildings throughout New Jersey in most counties. Um, the SIL program's mission is to enhance the quality of life for residents for residents in our living in our senior housing developments. And we do that through the training and resources provided um, through the SIL program. Um, we do have, um, now I do have to mention that the program is not a requirement through for all of our finance buildings. It's really a benefit to our buildings and buildings do have um, the option, senior buildings do have the option of joining the program. As I said, right now, we have over 110 buildings participating in the SIL program. We require, um, we do have requirements and minimum standards. So we develop the minimum standards and we do provide training um, and workshops throughout the year. Um, and what we strive for is um, that the minimum standards, which are the provision of case management, health and senior wellness programs, education and social services programs, they are to be found in every building because those are the minimum standards. However, um, not all buildings look alike and that's a function of the building's owner and also, and that is also a function of the building's resources and their mission. But at a minimum, we, all our buildings look alike and many of our buildings obviously go beyond the minimum standards. And each year we serve approximately 11,000 residents through our SIL coordinators. Next, please. Um, I'd like to just talk about some of our partnerships that really touch on also health because we've been in place since 1988 um, and the agency has been in place since the 70s. Um, so we do have partnerships with the Division on Aging Services um, through the SHIP Counselor Training Program in which coordinators are trained to be SHIP counselors for their SIL building. The same is true through the New, New Jersey Health Ease Program where our SIL coordinators are trained to be leaders uh, for their buildings. With Rutgers School of Social Work, we did develop the Certificate in Senior Housing Issues. As many of you may know, Rutgers School of Social Work Continuing Education Program does have different certificate programs for professionals in the field of aging and also developmental disabilities. And we created in 2005 a Certificate in Senior Housing Issues because we felt that some some of the, the issues met by our on-site SIL coordinators and also property managers were very specific to senior housing. Um, more recently, we developed um, a partnership with Kane University's Occupational Therapy uh, Department, and we have um, an internship program with Kane University in many of our SIL buildings, um, although those SIL buildings are located in Northern New Jersey, Northern and Central New Jersey. And even more recently, we have developed um, uh, a relationship with Stockton University's School of Health Sciences in which we do have an occupational therapy internship program. And that program obviously is concentrated in buildings in South Jersey. And of course, we have our partnership with Rowan University's School of Osteopathic Medicine, New Jersey Institutes of Successful Aging. and um, Elise and Marilyn will be talking about this in a few minutes, but three SIL sites, three services for independent living sites were selected for the Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program, WEP grant. Next, please. 
And here is um, our fact sheet, which may be hard to read, but as Sue Brooks indicated, this will be on, on their website so that you can see it more clearly. But that, that is our um, fact sheet, which goes over um, the benefits and the requirements to participate. Next, please. Now, I do wanna mention low income housing tax credits because that's another way New Jersey Housing, which is a state agency, can bring health services, not only in established buildings or buildings that have been built in the 70s, but also um, to more recently funded and built buildings um, and the low income, and that is through our tax credit program. Um, the tax credit program was established under the Tax for Reform Act of 1986. And nationally, this program has created an estimated 3 million housing units. Um, and again, this is an example of affordable housing. Um, it's not subsidized housing, but it is affordable housing. And New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency does administer the program on behalf of the IRS. And as I mentioned, this is for households with incomes of up to 80 or 60% of area median income. Next, please. So um, the tax credit program is really um, one of the only ways um, currently um, to build buildings and to build affordable buildings. And this is both for family and senior developments and also supportive housing uh, developments. And what we do is each year, it's typically each year, we uh, award, we have a very competitive round in which we award tax credits to owners who have um, submitted uh, an, a successful tax credit application. What is, what is required of, of individuals or owners is um, to look at the qualified allocation plan every year or every round to identify priorities and goals specific to New Jersey. The QAP outlines eligibility requirements and points criteria. And again, as I said, the nine, there are two rounds and the 9% is extremely competitive because there really isn't that many options for, how, for uh, development of housing as, as we moved away from um, project-based uh, um, subsidized housing developments. So it's a very competitive process. Um, we do also have a 4%, which are as of right or non-competitive, and that is funded throughout the year. And how um, the um, tax credit program is very competitive is that many people want, many owners want this funding. And so there are points, the qualified allocation program identifies points um, which is provided um, to our owner, or to the applications um, based on our, our points. And so there always has been, since 1986, there's always ha has been points awarded for social services programs in different ways. However, um, back in 2019, we did unveil a brand new initiative called the new age-friendly senior cycle, which, um, was introduced in 2019 at New Jersey Housing. And um, through that, we, we have designed ways to allow seniors to age in place, but more importantly, we have incorporated health into um, our, our, our senior housing developments that are being built currently. Next, please. I wanted just to highlight um, what the, um, a friendly senior housing cycle looks like. We provide nine points from the following categories, on-site transportation, participation in the SIL program, provision of a licensed insured on-site healthcare provider, basically a wellness nurse, uh, provision of an on-site pharmacy, uh, wellness clinic, satellite hospital office PACE program, assisted living program, medical daycare program, and then there are points for accessible outdoor spaces and um, exercise rooms. And how the um, senior cycle was developed was looking at the AARP's um, age-friendly domains of living and um, also looking at, we were very interested in incorporating health 
into our, our senior buildings. And so owners can select um, up to nine points are, are awarded, awarded. And as I said, it's a very competitive round. So our owners and applications um, usually strive for 100 points. Next, please. I do wanna mention that um, we awarded in our first year of the age-friendly senior cycle because we have always funded senior buildings, but utilizing the initiative, the age-friendly senior cycle, we awarded five projects in 2019. They're located in both um, urban and suburban areas and five projects have been awarded in 2020, again, located throughout New Jersey and also in urban and or suburban areas. Um, we are gearing up for our next round in 2020, 2021. And um, through this age-friendly senior cycle, a variety of partnerships have been developed. Again, the buildings, the first five buildings that were awarded in this cycle have not been built yet, but they are under construction and will be hopefully ready for rent up in late 2021 or early 2022. Um, and um, the provid all of our um, five winners and actually 10, 10 awardees um, had a variety of programs that they are offering, um, including contracting with the PACE program, contracting with an assisted living provider, contracting with the Medicaid and or Medicare certified provider. And also one of our awardee, awardees partnered with the HUD awardee for HUD grants for supportive dem services demonstration for elderly households, which was the first foray into um, linking housing and health through um, a health pilot, a HUD pilot program. So that was very exciting. Next, please. Um, I also wanted to go over again, because we're talking about linking housing and health. Um, we, we do have, I think I went over this. So next, please. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Marilyn Mock, who is Policy Director for Senior and Wellness Services at Fair Share Support Services, who's going to tell you a little bit about some of the seminal work we have done at Northgate 2, which was our first pilot site. Uh, Marilyn? Thank you, Elise. Good morning, everyone. And I just wanted to um, echo the gratitude that Elise and Maria expressed to Parker and New Jersey advocates um, for aging well and giving us the opportunity to share some of our learnings through this partnership. So thank you. Next, Elise. So Fair Share Support Services is part, our parent organization is Fair Share Housing Development, which was funded in 1986 it manages 656 rental units in five affordable housing complex among six different locations. And the mission of Fair Share Housing Development is to promote economically and racially diverse communities through the Tri-County region, through the development of affordable housing with supportive services in order to improve the lives of moderate low income moderate income, low income, and very low income families, older adults and disabled individuals. Fair share housing development was very involved in the landmark decision by the New Jersey Supreme Court, um, which was the Mount Laurel Doctrine, um, so that the state could allocate a certain percentage of housing development um, for affordable housing communities. Next. These are our sites. Um, we're out of all of these sites, most of which are affordable housing sites for low income families. Northgate 2, which is the site where I'm located, is the only one of Fair Share's properties that actually serves not only low income families, but low income older adults and low income disabled adults. We are building another family housing complex in, currently under construction in Cherry Hill. And we're excited to say that we received tax credits 
from New Jersey HMFA to build 148 units of um, adult older adult housing in Mount Laurel. And we're hoping to uh, begin work on that project very soon. We're really excited about that project. Next. So I'm gonna talk about fair share um, support services located at North A2. That's a picture of our building. We are in North Camden. Um, we have 92 townhouse units for low income families. And then our high rise building, we have 302 units for low-income older adults and disabled individuals. We have about 360 individuals in our high-rise building. Um, our residents' demographics are 65% of our residents are Hispanic, mostly non-English speaking. We have 34% of our residents are African-American. Two-thirds are over the age of 50. So um, if they're not older adults, they're, they're rapidly aging. Um, and many of them have chronic conditions, predominantly high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and asthma. Next. Um, I just wanted to give you an overview of Camden Health Statistics. Um, you know, what would, Camden is a very low income, um, urban site where um, most of the residents are Camden are, are folks of color um, who have um, multiple chronic conditions and compared with the national averages, our health, our health statistics are pretty poor citywide, um, lower or higher depending upon what category you're talking about um, than most of the country. And I think what stands out for me is um, the number of the percentages of people with chronic conditions. And also when you look at physical distress, it really is anxiety about, physical distress is defined as anxiety about your physical and mental health conditions. A lot of our residents um, have trauma histories. In fact, our social service assessment, which is a little bit separate from our um, resident health risk assessment that we're gonna talk about in detail, at least we'll speak about later on. Um, but our social service assessment really looks at the impact of the social determinants of health um, on our residents and also the impact of trauma on older adults in our community. Um, so when you combine some of the health physical health conditions that, that in general Camden residents suffer from, along with some of the behavioral health issues that they struggle with, along with their experiences of trauma, um, you're talking about layers of health issues that we're trying to address here. Next. This is just a picture of the residents in our courtyard. Actually, this picture was taken before one of our health initiatives we did um, sort of a community walk. Um, one of our residents is carrying um, the Puerto Rican flag. Um, and this was them before they did their walk. So it was people who didn't have issues with mobility taking the walk as well as somebody who needed to use a wheelchair to walk around. But it was a chance for them as well to, um, to kind of socialize together. And this was prior to COVID-19. Next. So Fair Share Support Services is the nonprofit social services arm of Northgate 2. Um, and the, how it came about was in response to the growing and evolving health and social service related needs of the older adult and disabled residents um, among our population. And really our mission is to allow our residents to age in place for as long as safely possible um, in the community that they love, around the people who really matter to them, which is, you know, their fellow community members and staff who are really here to support them. Um, it expands, our project expands the scope of the social service department to embed care coordination, health-related services to reduce emergency department visits, hospitalizations, improve health and to forestall long-term care placement. Next. 
our staffing configuration, we have a social service director, two bachelor's level social workers, a community health worker. We have been able to partner with Rutgers to have social work interns, both bachelor's level and master's level. Um, we are a partner of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. So we have a recent college graduate who dedicates one year of their life to work in an impoverished community. And we have an administrative assistant. I just wanna say something about um, the bachelor's level social worker and community health worker. We're gonna talk, at least we'll talk about um, our GREP partnership with Rutgers Camden School of, um, of Nursing. Um, our community health worker and our bachelor's level social worker works very closely with the nursing students during their student rotation. And they are actually interprofessional partners that work together to evaluate the health issues among our residents. Our community health worker also, um, which is grant funded through our um, Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Project grant um, in our partnership with New Jersey ISA. That worker um, has access to a health information exchange that she, she checks on a daily basis um, to learn who of our, which of our residents are in the hospital or have had an emergency department visit within the past six months. And what she does, her role is really focused primarily on following up with residents post hospital or post emergency department discharge. Um, she, because she knows when they are discharged, she can immediately follow up with them to make sure that they understand their discharge instructions and are following them to make sure that they um, have any medication prescriptions filled and to make sure that they schedule um, and a post-discharge appointment with their primary care physician. In addition, she accompanies residents to, um, to procedures. She accompanies them to um, primary care visits, tertiary care visits, um, medical testing. So um, she spends as much time out of the office as she does in the office. And it's particularly useful when you're talking about working with a predominantly Spanish speaking population, she can um, translate information, written information that they receive from medical providers, in addition to serving as a translator on medical visits. Next. So these are just some of the components of the case management services that we provide, um, translation interpretation service, assistance with medical appointment scheduling, assistance with medical transportation to medical appointments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, accompaniment to primary care and tertiary care appointments and medical procedures, and our annual and event-based resident health risk assessment developed um, in collaboration with New Jersey ISA. Next. Some health-related components of our program include the health risk assessment. We also partnered about seven years ago with an ALP, um, Caring Incorporated, who um, operates on-site in our building to link residents with assisted living services, which has been very critical, particularly with residents who are um, experiencing some cognitive deficits also with residents who have difficulty with managing their medication. Um, Caring Inc. has been very instrumental in helping to address some of those issues. Um, we have access to a health information exchange, as I mentioned earlier as well, through our partnership with the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. That's a daily feed of information that everybody in the department has access to particularly our community health worker focuses on. We have conducted evidence-based programming, like chronic disease self-management, diabetes self-management, Tomando, which is the Spanish version of chronic disease self-management. We've had a number of residents participate in those programs um, based on their um, interest and commitment to improving their own health outcomes. 
Um, we sponsored exercise programs. Right now, also as part of our, our web grant, we have received funding to do a technology program linking residents to um, telehealth visits with their primary care physician. So that is getting underway. And we've also um, sponsored a couple of nutrition programs through partnerships with food banks and food cupboards. Next. This is one of our residents, Gregory. Gregory is the chair of our resident advisory board. Um, and his goal was to improve his health through weight loss. Um, he suffered from diabetes and his quote, which I love is people say I'm an inspiration. They say, if, I, if you can do it, I can do it. I feel great and I'm glad to do something for myself as well as help other people. Gregory also led um, a support group for residents around health related issues. And that is a picture of him with one of our former community health workers who worked very closely with him to support his achievement of his health goals. Next. Speaking of um, residents, um, what we found um, in this initiative is that resident engagement is critical and key to the set success of any health related initiatives among our population. So we need to get we needed to get buy-in from from our residents. And we convened about 10 years ago a resident advisory board to um, serve as advisors to staff um, in terms of health initiatives, um, to serve as ambassadors for any health initiatives that, that we develop to kind of um, gain buy-in from the resident population and also to get their input on any health related initiatives that we want to implement. And they have been key in helping to steer and guide um, our program development, um, giving us a yay or a nay um, to some of our ideas and really coming up with ways that they can um, sponsor some of their own programs. So the RAB actually sponsored several years ago um, a CPR class um, that they paid for through some fundraising um, ideas that they had. And they also sponsored an Ask the Doctor session where we invited a primary care physician to meet with our residents and they could ask general questions, health related questions. Um, the RAB also worked with um, our, our social service staff and our property management staff um, to support a smoke cessation program in the building. So gaining the support of residents and engaging them in any type of health-related program um, de development is really foundational to, um, to what we do because if we don't have buy-in from the residents, we can't achieve the outcomes that we hope to achieve with them. Next. So these are just a list of some of the program initiatives, current and past, um, that have taken place on site. We are currently doing Zumba, Walk Away the Pounds, line dancing. Um, we've offered massage therapy um, to our residents. We, um, of course, our geriatric work workforce enhancement program that we are doing in collaboration with New Jersey ISA is critical and key to the work that we're doing. We partnered with the Camden Coalition to start a 15 month colonoscopy screening project. Um, we've done resident led nutrition programs. We are doing a senior companion program. We've done healthy cooking classes. And of course, you know, as many housing providers know, um, health and social activities are critical to maintaining the health and emotional and physical well being of our residents. Next. This is, I thought it was important to include a picture of our community room, which is a very large space in our building where we hold activities 
We meet with um, Rutgers Camden School of Nursing students um, in this room. It allows us to do right now in the midst of our COVID environment, um, very um, limited number of activities that we can, where we can maintain social distance. Um, resuming activities for our residents was really um, important after a year of having no activities. Um, and our, we worked with our, our resident advisory board to ask them, like, how do we do this? How would you um, prefer that we open up activities to our residents and still maintain um, health and, and safety um, in this COVID environment? And they actually came to us with a few recommendations of activities that they thought were important to residents and how we can maintain proper social distancing um, during those activities. Next. And then these are some of our partnerships that we have developed um, within the community. So of course, our, our partnership with New Jersey ISA um, around our GWEP project, Caring Incorporated, that that operates our um, BALP in the building, the Camden Coalition that not only um, gives us access to the health information exchange, but also access to um, a platform called TrackVIA where we can um, document our activity with and on behalf of residents. Um, the Camden Area Health Education Center that trains our community health workers, the Food Bank of South Jersey that has offered nutrition programs and provides um, an on-site um, food pantry for our residents. The Community Planning Advisory Council, we have partnered with them to offer a senior companion program on-site to address loneliness and social isolation. And our partnership with Mode of Care, formerly um, Logistic Care, uh, to offer non-emergency medical transportation. And we actually meet with them on a monthly basis because um, if residents can get to their health care related appointments, um, what we're doing is actually in vain. So um, to, to have that relationship with Mode of Care, um, and to squelch problems when they happen is really critical to, um, for, to allow residents to have great access to their healthcare provider. Next. Um, this is another quote from Elsa. Elsa participated in our chronic disease self-management class in Spanish, our Tomando class, and also um, she participated in our on-site exercise class. And she says, I like it here very much. They do a lot of things to keep us busy and entertained so we can enjoy our lives and make good friends. They have nutrition classes and I love Zumba. I, I've got a lot of pain in my back because of a car accident. The doctor said I have nerve damage. For one month, I couldn't move my arm, but the exercise class has really helped me move. I feel a lot better now. Next. Um, I just wanted to speak about some of the innovation challenges and considerations in our um, partnership relationships. And I think um, sometimes as providers of housing, we tend to kind of undersell the value that we bring um, to these big healthcare systems. And I think it's really important that housing providers articulate very clearly the value add that you bring to the partnership. And I would say the major value add is the relationship that you have with the residents in your building, as well as the relationship that you have developed with other community partners. And, not, and it's important not to underestimate that. And then have mechanisms in place to develop and monitor sustained resident program interest and involvement and that that is not an afterthought, that resident engagement um, is where you start. Um, and you're constantly checking to validate what you're doing, um, that what you're doing makes a difference for the residents, is useful, and is something that they're um, genuinely interested in. Um, challenging your assumptions about what residents need and want, and that relates very closely to having those mechanisms 
in place to monitor um, resident interest and involvement and just periodically checking to make sure that what you assume about the population in your building is actually accurate um, and reflects what residents need and want. And then you're gonna engage those residents in program development, not just to say that you involve residents, but really genuine interest in what they're interested in and soliciting their, their buy-in so that they can be ambassadors in your building for whatever program initiatives you have jointly decided are needed within the community. Um, developing a means to collect and evaluate data um, and to measure impact. And, um, you know, data collection is not typically something that housing providers really focus on. Um, we have to lean very heavily on our healthcare partners to help walk us through that and figure out how do we do that in the most effective way possible. Um, exploring funding options and considering unlikely sources and in-kind contributions. So we actually looked at um, partners that were non-traditional. We have partnered with an arts department in a local university to do an activity with the residents that addresses some of their social isolation um, and loneliness. Um, look outside of the, the, the traditional box, the typical funding opportunities that you might think of. Um, there's a whole world out there that's looking to get access to older people because of just the sheer volume of older people in the community. Um, so, you know, be, trying to be very creative when you think about what are the funding opportunities that exist out there for you. Next. And I think that's it. I thank you very much, Elise. Thank you very much, Marilyn. <clears throat> Marilyn and, and Maria have both made it very easy for me to uh, link my presentation to theirs <clears throat> simply because of the fact that we chose our partners carefully partnering with HMFA and with Northgate to, to make sure that we could have you know, a successful project. Uh, <clears throat> as, as you know, I'm from Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine, and I specifically work in the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging, which is known as NJISA or NJISA, uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as Marilyn always says, uh, NJ Institute for Successful Aging. I actually serve as co-director of the Institute, but also as <clears throat> uh, co-director of our Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. Next. <clears throat> I'm going to present to you a little bit of background about the School of Osteopathic Medicine, which is where uh, I'm based, <clears throat> and also about the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging. This is actually just a shot that focuses you on the fact that we are Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. Next. Uh, we as a, a school have 745 medical students and over 400 residents, interns, and fellows who are in training in different hospital sites throughout New Jersey. <clears throat> we have one of the largest faculties among osteopathic medical schools, uh, not to mention over 550 volunteer faculty. Uh, our school is also a leader in extramural research funding, which is fairly unusual for an osteopathic school. We also offer a number of dual degrees. In other words, a, a, a DO, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, um, as well as PhDs in various areas, Juris Doctor degrees. So we offer a variety of educational opportunities for people who seek medicine um, as a career choice. The other thing is too, that we are now duly accredited for um, graduate medical education for both DO and MD programs. Uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, these are our two campuses, our Stratford campus, which is our uh, first campus. Uh, the picture on the bottom is the actual academic center. And then the building on the upper left is actually the um, Rowan Medicine building, which is where our clinical practice is. The pictures on the right are the Rowan Medicine campus on um, the in Sewell, which is in Gloucester County. Uh, and 
the building on the bottom is our Risen Center, which is for individuals with uh, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Next. Uh, <clears throat> Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine is a school that is committed to clinical services, education, and research. <clears throat> we actually have three designated institutes, and an institute is essentially a center of excellence which really focuses on a three-part mission of clinical service, education, and research. Uh, <clears throat> New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging, where I'm from, provides uh, an interprofessional team approach to both primary and specialized care of older individuals across the continuum. So we have services in the hospital setting, ambulatory office practice, community-based settings, assisted living, and long-term care settings. We're also responsible for educating and training health professions students, including medical students, students from other health professions, disciplines, healthcare providers, direct care workers, families, and caregivers. Um, we also conduct basic science and biopsychosocial research in aging. So that completes the three legs of our three-part mission. We also have a CARES Institute, which provides medical and mental health services for children who have been abused or traumatized in some way. Uh, and we also have the Neuromusculoskeletal Institute, uh, which is very closely um, intertwined with us in terms of evaluating and treating chronic pain and customizing care based on patients' needs. That uh, program also offers uh, substance abuse, uh, substance use disorder treatment and medication assisted treatment for people who are on opioids. Next, please. <clears throat> so moving on, um, what is the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging? Well, the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging is an interdisciplinary center of excellence. We're committed to improving the quality of life in older adults as I said, through clinical care, education, and research. We have the, a very large interprofessional faculty consisting of the largest concentration of geriatric professionals in the state. We're very proud of that. We have <clears throat> over 60 geriatricians, geriatric psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, neuropsychologists, social workers, education specialists, and behavioral and basic science uh, researchers. <clears throat> Next, please. Our mission is to promote successful aging and improve the quality of life of older adults by providing a comprehensive clinical geriatric services that is built on the team approach to care. We're very proud of that. We have always had a team approach to care. And the way that our uh, ambulatory practice is configured, we actually have the team, at least pre-COVID, we had the team physically in one spot. So the team uh, could interact and uh, identify and address patients' needs. Uh, we maintain a national standing as one of the preeminent interprofessional geriatric education programs in the country, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. <clears throat> we demonstrate leadership in aging research, both in biomedical and biopsychosocial areas. We've had a number of NIA, NIH grants. We disseminate information to the public about successful aging, and we're actively engaged in geriatric healthcare policy and standards and advocacy for aging. Next, please. Uh, I have a few uh, selected historical highlights and I'm only giving you selected ones, mainly because of the fact that we've been around since 1983. The School of Osteopathic Medicine was one of the first medical schools in the country to actually make a commitment to geriatrics, which we did begin in 1983. Uh, we had our first um, funding from the state in 1986 that funded what was then our dementia evaluation program. And in 1989, we created a Center for Aging. We've enjoyed over three decades of consistent uh, grant funding from the federal government to support geriatrics education and training programs, uh, of which the uh, GWEP is, is one. Uh, in 2002, uh, we were recognized by US News and World Report and actually enjoyed a number of years of that level of recognition in the top 20 graduate uh, medical education programs in geriatrics in the country. In 2005, our Center for Aging was actually designated a statewide institute, and we became the New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging. And then in 2013, uh, with the New Jersey Medical and Health Sciences Restructuring Act, we became Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine, known as Rowan SOM. 
We used to be part of what was known as University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, if you're wondering what we were before we became part of Rowan SOM. In 2014, we had uh, a very important um, honor here. We actually were designated a Department of Geriatrics and Gerontology, and we received a William G. Rohrer Endowed Chair uh, in Geriatrics. And that endowment uh, you know, is occupied by Dr. Anita Chopra, who is currently director of our New Jersey Institute for Successful Aging and chair of our department. Uh, in, in 2015 and 2019, uh, we received funding for the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Grant. Our 2015 grant was three years. Our 2019 grant is for five years. And in 2020, uh, we achieved recognition uh, as level one designation as an age-friendly health system from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or IHI. Next. So <clears throat> NJISA, we're known for building partnerships to promote successful aging and providing quality care in geriatrics for the older individuals we serve. We want to preserve their independence and function we want to identify what matters to older individuals in managing their life goals and managing their health. We seek to involve patients, families, and caregivers as key members of the healthcare team. We support families to reduce caregiver burden. Caregiving is an unbelievably uh, stressful job, particularly in the case of individuals with dementia. So we do strive to support our caregivers. We provide education and resources to assist with navigation. Through complex healthcare and social services systems, we have two wonderful licensed clinical social workers who do that, and we provide interprofessional team based care. Next, please. <clears throat> this is just a little uh, pictorial of our age friendly care of older adults and our interdisciplinary team approach. Uh, we address needs across the continuum, and you can see that we go, you know. Patients often move across different parts of this uh, continuum. We may see someone in the ambulatory office. We may need to admit someone to the hospital. If they get deconditioned in the hospital, they may need to go to subacute care for some rehab. They may need to go to a nursing home or perhaps an assisted living facility. Uh, or most often, you know, we like to encourage them to return home, but our physicians can provide care across that continuum. So that continuity is very important uh, for our patients. Uh, the other thing that I do want to emphasize is that because we are part of Rowan Medicine, we have over 130 uh, healthcare providers, primary care providers. We log over 200,000 visits per year in our Rowan Medicine program, and we offer primary care and 14 specialties. So we can provide all kinds of services uh, to our patients. I want, next please. I wanna just <clears throat> highlight our specialized programs uh, in our ambulatory setting. And our, prop, our most important one, and the one that is well known is our memory assessment program, which is also known as MAP. And it's comprised of an interprofessional team um, consisting of geriatric psychiatry, neuropsychology, and social worker. We provide comprehensive evaluation of older adults with memory loss, and we support families and caregivers uh, through the, the Alzheimer's journey. We also provide primary care and comprehensive geriatric consultation for individuals on multiple medications and with multiple chronic conditions. We have a house calls program for over 400 individuals uh, throughout the community. We offer behavioral health services uh, with um, caregiver counseling. We've done a lot of uh, telehealth counseling uh, through our um, licensed clinical social workers for families and caregivers and patients, particularly helping them deal with anxiety and loneliness as a result of COVID. <clears throat> and we are also the Southern New Jersey Regional Site for the Huntington's Disease Family Service Center. Uh, next, please. So I've given you sort of an overview of the clinical services we provide, and I think it's important to understand that because um, it really, when you talk about a value added, that's the value added we bring to our partners in terms of <clears throat> being able to facilitate linkage with um, specialized geriatric services that are based on 
uh, evidence-based practice models. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program grant, also known as the GWEP, which links housing, health, and interprofessional education and training. Next. This is a HRSA disclaimer, which we're required to put in all of our presentations, just letting you know that this project has been funded uh, by a grant through the Department of Health and Human Services, um, Health Resources and Services Administration. Uh, this current grant is for a five-year period, as long as there's funding available in the federal budget. Next, please. So I'm going to tell you a little bit now about our project, which sort of makes it unique. Uh, our project links housing and health to support aging in place and affordable housing. Um, we have multiple stakeholders and academic community-based partners to support an interprofessional team-based approach to care of older individuals. Um, I had mentioned before that we started some of this work several years ago. We actually began with Northgate 2. Um, about five years ago, and we developed an evolving model at Northgate 2 that we've been constantly revising and customizing uh, both at Northgate and for implementation in three other new sites that we have selected as partners for this current grant period. I want to emphasize that this is not a research project. It is really a clinical quality improvement project. It is a project that focuses on interprofessional training and education and improving the quality of care that we provide to the older individuals we, we serve. Uh, we're really looking at um, introducing health profession students, staff, and other care providers, not only to evidence-based care of older individuals, but to the interprofessional model of training and education. Uh, we do that through the implementation of the resident health risk assessment, which we call the RHRA, which Marilyn had mentioned in her presentation. <clears throat> we utilize the 4Ms framework, which is what matters, mentation, medications, and mobility. And that framework actually facilitates collaboration, engagement, and guides structure and process uh, for our programming, both for our resident health risk assessment as well as our interprofessional training and education. I think the important piece about the resident health risk assessment is in buildings where uh, there was no way to provide baseline information to assist staff in identification of resident needs and facilitate their access to services or interventions, the resident health risk assessment has been providing us with some baseline information to better address residents' needs and improve their access to care. Next, participation of residents in the resident health risk assessment is voluntary. It does not impact their tenancy at all. Uh, they consent to participate in the resident health risk assessment and they can withdraw or refuse to answer a question at any time. <clears throat> Sites do use their standard resident consent form so it doesn't stray from their normal processes. Um, Guiding programmatic changes based on feedback and information we receive from residents, from staff, from students is important to us. And we use the rapid cycle quality improvement process, which is based on the plan, do, study, act model, which I'll talk to you a little bit about shortly. I also um, want to emphasize that resident data is securely maintained by building staff and is used for reassessment and care management interventions by the building staff. Any data that we collect for grant reporting purposes is given to us in de-identified aggregated fashion by, program, uh, by our program evaluators. And it's given to us by the buildings. So the buildings actually de-identify and aggregate the data for our use. We do not see individuals' uh, health risk assessments. The only time um, we actually, um, talk about residents' uh, specific needs is when we're doing case-based interprofessional um, team review, uh, which is a clinical intervention and is a training and education experience for students. Um, our team-based case review is conducted in person or virtually. We have um, e implemented either Zoom or WebEx in each of our um, affordable housing buildings. There are the three new sites, which I'm going to talk about soon, and of course, Northgate too. And that supports interprofessional education and development of person-centered plans of care. 
And I think our most important thing is being able to link residents to needed services and supports. The other thing was that with COVID-19, we had a small amount of additional grant funding to support the implementation of telehealth technology. And each one of our participating buildings got some money to beef up their internet services, to provide iPads, to facilitate telemedicine visits between residents and physicians, and to also make it easier for building staff uh, to participate in team-based conferences and educational sessions. The other thing we're planning, and it's going to be probably implemented in June or July, is uh, what Marilyn had mentioned, which is the track via electronic database, uh, which we're going to make available in our three new sites. Um, and uh, it's already available in Northgate, which is a restricted access secure electronic database for data recording and reporting. Um, and that will facilitate us getting uh, de-identified aggregated data to support our project outcomes. Next, please. So this is a little infographic of our Aging in Place initiative partners, New Jersey GWEP, of course, and NJISA and Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine uh, <clears throat> are at the center. And our partners, of course, oops, we lost our slide. Our partners, Sue, can you get that slide back? Oh, here we go. Our partners are New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Administration, uh, Fair Share Housing, Northgate 2 in Camden, New Jersey, and Trent West, uh, which is in Trenton. And you can see that those two are high rise buildings. They're very similar in vintage and very similar in style and size. <clears throat> we have two smaller facilities, Benedict's Place in Cherry Hill and Rittenberg Manor in Egg Harbor City. And then, of course, we have our academic partners, Rutgers University School of Nursing, which actually was a partner in our first three-year grant and continues in this five-year grant. And in the second year of our current grant, we introduced Stockton University uh, as a new academic partner as well. So we're very excited about that. And then, of course, Marilyn had mentioned Camden Coalition of Health Providers, uh, which has been a longstanding partner with Northgate 2. And they are the group that actually uh, we work with for getting track via and enabling sharing of information. Next slide, please. I want to introduce you to the 4Ms framework uh, of an age-friendly health system. This is really sort of cutting edge. Uh, as we know, uh, there are 46 million older Americans in the United States, and by 2060, they're uh, going to essentially double to about 98 million. The majority of them have multiple chronic diseases and are on multiple medications. In 2019, what happened was the John A. Hartford Foundation, in collaboration with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and in partnership with uh, the American Hospital Association and Catholic Health Association of the United States, actually um, launched the Age-Friendly Health Systems Initiative. So it happened in 2019, and I was excited to hear that when Maria spoke of the uh, age-friendly um, uh, senior cycle that they put in place um, to allow uh, seniors to age in place and support that through HMFA uh, linked funding. Uh, that happened in 2019 as well. So you can really see the importance of policy change and the whole idea of the age uh, friendly health system and the 4Ms framework uh, is guided by three major principles. One is guided by evidence-based practices, which are based on what matters to the individual. In other words, aligning each older um, individual's specific health care goals and preferences, uh, not only in terms of end of life care, but across settings of care. Very often we as healthcare providers, um, you know, assess someone in the office, we identify what their problems are, we tell them what they should do. And now what we're really focusing on is what matters to the older individual um, in terms of their health care goals and what they want, not only at end of life, but in terms of what will make their, their daily life better? What do they hope to accomplish? What can they focus on? Um, you know, the other thing is too that, you know, we want to cause no harm. So 
obviously looking at medications. Medication is definitely necessary, but we want to make sure it doesn't interfere with what matters to the older adult. It doesn't interfere with their mobility or their cognitive status across settings. And many individuals are on multiple medications. Sometimes those medications interact. So we need to be cognizant of that. Um, the other thing is too that, um, you know, mentation is important and our ability to identify, prevent, treat and manage things like dementia, depression, delirium across settings of care is critical. Uh, we do provide special training to our partners on what we call the aging process and the three Ds, dementia, depression, and delirium, so that they're aware of these things. But cognitive change is something that is not part of normal aging. And many of us have noticed changes in cognition in some of our building residents or in our parents or loved ones, and we want to be alert for that. The other thing, of course, is mobility. And ensuring that older adults can move safely every day to maintain function, to do what matters to them, but also to get around so that they don't decompensate and lose their ability. So, you know, the guiding principles of evidence-based practices, causing no harm and being consistent with what matters to the older adult are really what guide um, this resident health risk assessment and our age-friendly um, health system and age-friendly affordable housing environment and the work we're doing. Next, please. I had mentioned before that we use rapid cycle quality improvement. Uh, this is something that is uh, available. You can actually uh, click on the link to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and find out uh, a lot about the uh, Plan Do Study Act model. But basically, you know, uh, we focus on identifying what the problem is, describing care consistent with the four M's design or adapt our workflow to support that, provide the care, study how we perform, and then improve or do, you know, put in place what we need to uh, sustain that care or improve our process or our structure. And I always say to people, if something is not working right and your plan is not working right, it's either one of two things. You don't have the structure to support it or the process needs modification. Uh, so I put this in here because some people don't know about the Plan Do Study Act model, um, but it really makes sense and it actually guides our project evaluation process. We use it uh, on a regular basis to make programmatic changes. Next. I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the resident health risk assessment. And our goal, of course, is to get to know the older adults in, in the affordable housing buildings in which we're working. And we want to do that so we can support their needs. We want to support their aging in place through person-centered plan of care. As I had mentioned, uh, and, and Marilyn had mentioned as well, that the resident health risk assessment has gone through an evolution. We started it about four or five years ago um, in Northgate, we have modified it umpteen times. We continue to modify it. And in 2019, with the advent of the 4Ms framework, we actually incorporated the 4Ms very specifically into the resident health risk assessment for two reasons. One, to help staff identify the 4Ms very easily. And two, to help our health profession students identify it. Um, the, what the 4Ms are. And it really has provided a good infrastructure to support interprofessional education and training. There are two major components of the resident health risk assessment. One is the social service component, which includes the typical stuff that you would think. Demographics such as age, language, race, ethnicity, religious or cultural preferences, educational le level, health literacy, financial and insurance information, advanced directive, and healthcare and service providers. That's the basic social service uh, information that most, most buildings need. I know Northgate has a social services department. Other buildings may not. They may just, uh, you know, they may uh, offer the SIL program, but they do collect some of this information. And then we added the health component which really looks at medical history, the status of current chronic conditions, individuals' perceptions of their health, 
risk factors, things we need to look out for so that they don't get worse and we can support them to age in place. Medications, seeing if there are any medication interactions that we should be alert for, any medications that can cause falls. Any history of drug usage or uh, chronic uh, pain medication usage. Cognition or mentation. People's mental status, their ability, ability to remember, their ability to make decisions that require multiple steps in terms of the thought process. Um, looking at falls, um, different types of activities, both um, acti uh, instrumental activities of daily living and basic activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing. Can they take their medications? Can they pay their bills? Um, you know, social activity, and then social determinants of health. And many of our affordable housing sites are located in buildings um, that are in places like Camden City or Trenton, where social determinants of health, in other words, the um, resources in the community may not always be supportive of uh, accessing good health care or accessing healthy food. Um, people may not be able to get uh, you know, adequate exercise. The other thing is too that COVID has caused a lot of anxiety and loneliness, um, certainly food insecurity, uh, violence is prevalent in some communities. We've seen an increase in mental health uh, problems. Um, and you know, I think the other thing is too that you know, while we do look at mental health needs and moods, uh, it's very important to see whether or not if someone needs care that we can help them access care to improve their lives. I think the important thing is too that when we compile the social service and health risk assessments, we actually come up with a summary of needs and a plan for services. And that's one of the key reasons we have students involved so they can participate as members of an interprofessional team, but they can also assist us as members of the team in identifying individualized uh, plans for services for building residents who are in need of some sorts of support. Next, please. So we use evidence-based geriatric assessment tools. That's one of the goals of the 4Ms. Uh, what matters really has to do with the advanced care plan and person-centered goals of care. Um, there are a number of programs uh, that are available in terms of advanced care planning. Uh, the Five Wishes, many of you may know about that or have heard about that. Uh, there's a program called Conversations of Your Life or COYL. Uh, which we're actually offering um, to the community uh, this spring uh, in several sessions. And it's both for you know, older individuals, but caregivers of older individuals and families to really talk about person-centered goals of care and you know, what people want you know, for their future. Should they become really ill or should they just want to function to the best of their ability and enjoy their lives the most they can? Uh, medication. Um, we look at medication review. We identify high risk medications. We use a, a number of lists to help us do that. One of the best known evidence based lists is the Beers list, although that may be a little cumbersome for most people to use. Mentation. Um, we do uh, a depression screen on everyone using the patient health questionnaire, which is a two, que a two question questionnaire to assess depression. If someone seems depressed, we go on to do a longer questionnaire, uh, which is called the PHQ-9. We also do the mini cog, which tests people's recall of three words and also asks them to draw the clock. And for, for mobility, we use the CATS activities of daily living scale and the Lawton Brody instrumental of activities of daily living scale. And to assess falls and fall risk, we do the timed up and go, which is known as the tug. I'm not gonna go into all of those assessment tools, but I do uh, actually have uh, some screenshots. Next, please. that show you some of those things. Um, the cognitive screen, uh, and you can see, and I highlighted in yellow, the four Ms, the cognitive screen is what measures mentation. And um, we have the score there. I do have actually on the right here is actually the uh, abbreviated mini cog with instructions for administration and scoring. And I think you can see that actually pretty well on this slide, but that's how we uh, 
we uh, check fermentation. And remember, these are only screening tools. They are not diagnostic. All they let us know is that there may be a problem for which further evaluation may be necessary. I had mentioned the depression screen, the PHQ-2, and you can see questions A and B there, which are the first two questions. And then of course, we could go on to additional questions um, you know, if needed. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, here we have uh, the CATS Index of Independence in Daily Living. And um, you can see that we look at bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, continence, feeding, and uh, whether or not people are independent or they are dependent. And Activities of daily living really are an indication if someone can't do it on their own, do they need some um, cell services, do they need some uh, services from a, an assisted living type provider, or do they need uh, higher level services. The instrumental activities of daily living, which is on the right, um, actually includes um, the ability to use the telephone, um, the um, ability to shop for oneself, to go out independently for small purchases, or if you need to be accompanied, the ability to prepare your own food and what level of assistance you may need. Uh, housekeeping, can you maintain a house alone? Do you need occasional assistance? Do you need help with home maintenance tasks? Uh, do you do your own laundry? Can you travel independently on public transportation? Are you able to take your own medications in the correct dosage at the correct time? And can you handle finances? And very often we start to see uh, changes in people's um, cognition or mentation with these higher level functions called instrumental activities of daily living, which really wind up being for us, um, you know, a telltale sign that someone needs further evaluation. If someone who used to pay their bills now can't pay their bills or can't balance their checkbook, or they're getting mixed up or confused in taking their medications, it means we need to take a closer look. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I, I think that you might have missed the one slide on, on my falls assessment. Can you go back two slides, Sue, please? Okay, go forward. Okay, keep going. That's all right. Oh, no, you can. <laughs> okay, whoop, back. Okay, we skipped over false history and I wanted to make sure that 4Ms and mobility is covered. Do you feel unsteady on your feet or like you could fall? Um, mobility is very important and can really um, inhibit people's uh, ability to walk freely or exercise. They may be fearful of falling. Uh, they may use a walker or an assistive device. Uh, you know, if someone has difficulty, you know, um, doing the time up, timed up and go, or, you know, they have a history of falls, we need to look at their medications. We need to look at, you know, whether or not um, they can get around on their own. And if they're at risk, we need to uh, perhaps get them a physical therapy evaluation or have them evaluated uh, for other things. But medications are always one thing that we look at to see whether or not uh, people are taking medications that may make them dizzy or may lower their blood pressure. I also wanted to include the screenshot here of what matters most to older individuals. And what matters most really has to do um, with uh, talking to an individual about what is important to them. And usually what we do is we say, we've talked about a lot of different health related issues. If you could focus on one thing over the next six months or a year, what would it be? What means the most to you in terms of, um, you know, if you wanted to improve something, 
what would you want to do? And if you looked at Marilyn's slides and you saw, you know, the two residents, the one who had lost weight, you know, he wanted to lose weight and improve his health. And the other one wanted to exercise so that she could reduce her back pain. So those are examples of health issues and getting feedback from an older individual about what matters most to them. We also have added as a result of our rapid cycle quality improvement process, a, a flag section for follow up and referrals to really be an indicator for our health profession students, but also for our staff is um, to help them identify where assistance is needed. Like for instance, if someone needs assistance in uh, developing an advanced care plan or identifying a durable power of attorney for health care or um, uh, financial power of attorney. If someone needs assistance with chronic conditions, do they need a referral to someone perhaps for osteoarthritis? Um, if someone is on multiple medications, do we need to interact with the, with the resident's uh, permission with their primary care physician to revisit some of the medications because of dizziness or falls risk. If someone is um, use, utilizing alcohol and they express an interest in reducing their alcohol consumption, you know, do they need a referral to a substance program? Same thing for drug use. And then of course, anything with regard to loneliness or social isolation, maybe a support group or some kind of behavioral mental health services. Uh, so those flags have really helped us in terms of not only doing reevaluations on residents, but making sure that we follow up because outcomes are important. Next, please. We already went over the Lawton Brody. Um, up back. This is the facilitating interprofessional education using the 4Ms framework. Uh, this wonderful case presentation review was uh, developed by Dr. Margaret Avalone from Rutgers University School of Nursing. And I share this with you because Marilyn had mentioned that the social service department and community health workers work very closely with students we have on site, whether they're social work students, nursing students, or any other students. And they also, <clears throat> um, do a joint case presentation. Not only do we do a case presentation at the end of the student rotation uh, when the students are there you know, for their clinical experience, but at the end of the rotation, the staff member who is paired with the student, um, together they pick an interprofessional case presentation, which they do together. And the purpose is to, you know, utilize the knowledge of one's own role and those of other professions in appropriately assessing and addressing the healthcare needs of the uh, residents in regard to the 4Ms framework, what matters to them, medications, mobility, and mentation. So as you can see, this reinforces the 4Ms framework. It reinforces the yellow areas highlighted in the resident health risk assessment. You see we have you know, some brief background information, and then our assessment really focuses on what matters, the medication risks that are identified, and the students actually have a medication sheet that they prepare, and they have a list of high-risk medications, um, you know, uh, the mentation, what the results were of the cognitive assessment, what the results were of the mobility assessment in terms of level of resident activity, the home assessment, is there a false risk in the building, was it identified? And did they identify um, you know, any risks, for instance, deficits in the ADLs or IADLs, which we had talked about, and then a prioritized problem list. We have them identify three or four problems. Obviously, we like to look at the resident's strengths. And if the resident is motivated to work on something and they really want to focus on something because it matters to them, <clears throat> you know, we want to make sure we identify that. And we come out. Um, eventually with recommendations, including a plan for follow-up, which is so critical. So our recommendations are based on what matters to the individual, what we've identified with regard to medications, mentation, and mobility. And then, you know, we have a, um, a progress note. So I think it's important to see this. I think it really helps frame the work of the interprofessional team 
and it really relates back to certainly what uh, Maria and HMFA were supporting in terms of age-friendly health systems and what Northgate and our uh, partners in Trent West, Rittenberg Manor, and um, Benedict's Place are trying to do with our residents. So now I just want to conclude by sharing with you a couple of um, some challenges, successes, and lessons learned. Next slide. Um, our housing sites differ very much in demographics, social determinants of health, staffing programs and services, funding availability, and partnership opportunities. Marilyn shared with you some of their resources and the things that they've put in place. Not every one of our buildings has all those resources and each community is very different in terms of availability and access to services in their community. So we always have to be conscious of that. And there is a learning curve for students as well as new staff who come on board, who need to learn about the community and the resources of the community and what partner agencies are available uh, to whom they can uh, link residents uh, based on their needs. The other thing is that training on the resident health risk assessment, geriatric evidence-based tools, and I've showed you screenshots of the ones we use, the aging process, which I mentioned, and the 3Ds, dementia, depression, and delirium, and the 4Ms framework is required. And we require that not only for building staff, <clears throat> Uh, but we uh, require it for faculty who are precepting students in a clinical rotation in affordable housing. I can honestly say that uh, we actually did the aging process and the three Ds for not only for building staff, but for facilities management and, and maintenance staff in the buildings as well. We did the aging process and the three Ds. And it was really fun training um, individuals who work uh, you know, in those areas because they're not health professionals, but they're so very attuned to the residents and what they see. And not only that, but, you know, many of them can share stories of what they've seen in their own families. So it sticks with them. So it's important that that kind of training be provided to create an age-friendly, affordable housing site. The other thing is technology is important and facilitates ongoing continuing education needs. And it facilitates interprofessional case review. It has also been a great facilitator of telehealth and telemedicine so that residents who can't get to the doctor's office can actually have a face-to-face -face visit with their healthcare provider through using an iPad and having the availability of some additional COVID funds to support internet access and some of the technology, whether it was a new laptop or creating a private telehealth room or telemedicine room for interviewing and, and maintaining social distancing has really been a great benefit to our partner buildings. <clears throat> I do need to say that uh, we have learned that project implementation is incremental. It happens slowly. Sometimes it takes two steps forward and three steps back, but we really benefit from the implementation of rapid cycle quality improvement uh, to enable us to collectively as a team evaluate what we're doing, how we do it, what the structure is, what the process is, and resolve barriers and challenges. We do that at the end of every student rotation. We do that at the end of every grant year to make sure that we are incrementally evaluating where we are as a group, as a team, that we take student um, uh, input into consideration and that we try to improve our structure and process. The other thing I wanna say is that interprofession, interprofessional education and training is not always intuitive. You would think that everyone would know how to do it, but it really requires a significant learning curve and preparation for faculty, staff, and students. We think we know what others, other members of the interprofessional team do, but sometimes we don't. And sometimes it's a surprise to us some of the things they can do. Uh, ample time is required for integration of content and the clinical experience into academic curricula. It just doesn't happen. We're trying to work with academia in terms of building partnerships, and sometimes they have their academic curricula already set, and working to align competencies that, that um, 
you know, uh, align also with academic accreditation goals and site and project needs uh, is critical. It just doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it takes a couple of years, and we certainly learned that with Rutgers. And rotation scheduling and requirements differ by school discipline and housing site. So those are some of the lessons that, that we've learned. I want to um, review some uh, pro, uh, preliminary project outcomes with you. It's uh, unusual that we have project outcomes, but we've been around long enough where we start have started to have some. And data collection on outcomes and impact is critical. It demonstrates that a project makes a difference, not only for building residents and for students, but for our partners, both the community-based partners and academic partners. And our ultimate goal is really to influence policy for housing and supportive services and interprofessional education and training to facilitate aging in place. Uh, some preliminary data, we had a pilot project at Northgate 2 from January through November of 2018. At that time, we completed 16 resident health risk assessments. Seven residents of those 16 were identified with cognitive impairment. Seven of them were bilingual residents who were referred to the memory assessment program in NJISA and actually were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And two of those residents, uh, when they were eventually not able to be safely maintained in Northgate 2, were placed in long-term care. I think one of the nicer things was that Northgate was able to place them in a facility that was close enough where building residents could go visit them um, you know, in a long-term care facility. From July 2019 to March 2021, um, we, uh, did, we uh, implemented the resident health risk assessment in our other sites. Uh, in Northgate, we actually had four Northgate two residents who have been referred for memory assessment and they have appointments, um, you know, within the next few weeks. If you look at the little table over to your bottom right, we have the uh, affordable housing site and we see in 2020 Northgate had a total of 43 um, resident health risk assessments. In 2021, we had 14 in terms of our new update. We had um, 20 in Northgate, we had seven in Benedict's Place, um, five in Trent West, and 17 in Rittenberg Manor. So our totals really are pretty good. We've done a considerable number of resident health risk assessments, and I'm so proud of our three new sites, Trent West, Benedict's Place, and Rittenberg Manor, because uh, they have done, um, Benedict's Place did 20, Trent West did 15 or more, and Rittenberg Manor did 19. And they just started doing their resident health risk assessments the end of January, beginning of February. So they've made great progress. So I'm proud of them. Uh, that's just a quantification of how many resident health risk assessments they did. We will have outcomes, hopefully, and impact at a later date. And our last slide is I just really want to uh, share with you some selected student comments from the Rutgers School of Nursing students um, on the interprofessional education and training experience. I learned firsthand the importance of the interprofessional team. You just can't do it alone, especially in a community setting. Another student said, after this experience, I am much more aware of just exactly how social determinants of health affect people in the communities we serve. I know going forward that asking the patients I encountered what matters to them is the best way to set patient goals. And those are just two uh, of many positive comments. Uh, next slide, we have uh, prepared uh, a bunch of selected resources for you. You can actually just click on those links and you can uh, access uh, a lot of the things uh, that we have uh, identified for you as uh, good resources uh, to reinforce what we've talked about. And if you need any more information, um, Marilyn, on behalf of Marilyn Mock and myself and, and Maria, next slide, uh, we'd like to thank you. And you can always contact uh, uh, Marilyn and myself at our emails. And at this point, I would like to uh, open our session up to questions. Would our speakers please uh, start their videos again? And we'll see if we have any questions for the group. Thank you, Lise. I really appreciate all that you've done. And thank you also, Marilyn, Maria, and Margaret. Um, just as a reminder, while Elise is transitioning to do any questions that you might have, our next event is going to be taking place on 
Tuesday, May 18th from 10 to noon. And that's on the PALS or Portable Assisted Living Services Program and the ALP Assisted Living Program model. So please mark your calendars and there will be more information coming soon about that. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I looked in the chat and I don't, I don't see uh, any, any questions. I know we did have a compliment on how great these programs were and I appreciate that. Sue, are you seeing any questions in your chat? I don't have that right at the moment. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please put them in there. Um, Can you open up everybody's mics in case anybody wants to ask uh, us a question? No, unfortunately I don't. Hold on a second, I have to get out of this then. Oh. Please bear with me, I'm having technical Well, while we're waiting to see if anyone wants to put any questions in the chat, um, you know, I hope this was informative to all of you. Um, I actually had a question for Maria. And, you know, we picked three new affordable housing sites to be our partners, you know, for the current grant project. And I remember you, Marilyn, uh, and myself sitting around the table at Northgate 2 uh, talking about it. Could you share with the group how they were select, how we selected uh, affordable uh, housing sites to partner with us? Yes, thank you, Elise. Um, well, you, you know, when Elise approached us, you know, New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency did jump at the opportunity to be part of the GWEP grant. Um, and Elise had indicated that we were, they would like to look at three different sites. So with um, looking at um, sites, I wanted to look at where they were located, whether they were in a suburban or, or urban area, and also whether they were part-time or full-time coordinators and in one place, um, Rittenberg Manor, we did have, we do have an on-site so coordinator who is also the on-site manager. So this gives us a lot of variables and a lot of scenarios to look at. So we have Rittenberg Manor, which is in um, Egg Harbor City. So it's suburban and, and the manager is the SIL coordinator. And that is a relatively small and newer building. Benedict's Place, um, is owned by the Camden Diocese. Um, and they are a very service enriched organization as well and um, have other grants and other programs in place for all of their, their senior buildings that they own. And then Trend Center West is also service enriched, but it is, and they, they have several layers of um, service coordinators at their buildings. Um, and, um, but they are located in Trenton, which is um, an urban area. So we looked at different variables to get a variety of um, places so we can see where the impact was in different places looking at different variables. Thank you, Maria, that was very helpful. Marilyn, I have a, a question for you. Uh, Heather McNally from Trent West wanted you to talk a little bit more about your partnership with Motive Care and, um, you know, do you help pay for rides to doctor's appointments? I'd be happy to. Um, so our partnership with Motive Care actually started maybe about six years ago um, when Motive Care was Logistic Care. We actually, um, with the help from the Camden Coalition, was able to negotiate a pilot project with them where we identified three dedicated vendors that would just serve this building. As a result of that, that kind of grew into a decision to have monthly meetings, if not monthly, then quarterly meetings with representatives from Logistic Care just to kind of do some problem solving, um, address issues that have come up with medical transportation. We also did a meeting that Logistic Care arranged between our residents and their vendors, their vendor providers. That was very helpful because residents had the opportunity to kind of express some of their concerns and share some of their experiences and issues with transportation also to talk about the successful 
um, experiences they had with particular vendors. Out of that just grew um, working very closely with uh, logistic cares liaison to our building and periodically holding those meetings between our liaison and our social service staff and our liaison and our residents. Um, we are now working with a different liaison with Motive Care um, and she's been very receptive to, um, to addressing some of our issues She's coming in actually next week to meet with our resident advisory board to hear some of their concerns around medical transportation. Um, so that's kind of evolved into a really nice relationship. They're much more responsive um, when there's a problem. I can contact the liaison directly if a resident comes in and reports that they missed their ride. We do not pay for um, any additional rides. Um, because we've had this great relationship develop with Logistic Care, and they've been very responsive to our concerns and the concerns of our residents. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Marilyn. <clears throat> uh, I have another question, and this is, um, you know, very particular uh, to the for all panelists, and it's from GF Harris. What housing resources are available for an 84 year old senior with mental health issues, for example, paranoid schizophrenia, who has been asked to leave her current assisted living due to the building closing for major renovations? We've contacted 22 communities and they will not accept her due to diagnosis and low monthly resources, 4,200 a month. Client is not compliant with medication and is her own power of attorney, very high functioning and mobile suggestions or guidance? Oh, that, that's, wow, a large question. Um, I, and I have specific questions for you. Um, in the assisted living facility that the person is living, did they not make arrangements? Is this temporary? Are you looking for housing that would be permanent for the person? I mean, that would be my first question. Um, secondly, did the assisted li living facility arrange for people from their facility to find other housing? Um, I one Maria, of the, things, the, uh, the person, the participant said that they're looking for permanent housing for this individual. Right. Um, well, I, I, I can't believe to... the assisted living facility at, uh, asked the family to relocate the resident as they don't want her back. Well, that's, you know, I can, Maria, if I can just jump in. Yes. Um, you know, there are long waiting lists for affordable housing. Um, so getting somebody, when you have an immediate crisis need, it's almost impossible to find permanent housing. Um, but there also is not the ability for providers to discriminate against anyone based on, the, based on their disability. Um, so that cannot happen. A provider, a housing provider can say, well, she can't come here um, because, or he, because of, of um, an issue with their mental health. On the flip side, um, it's very challenging for people to have a successful experience um, in um, affordable housing when they are not taking their medication and they have serious mental health issues. It's hard for them to adapt to the environment. It's hard for other residents to develop relationships with them successfully. And it's hard for the staff to, uh, to help support them um, when, they're not be when they're not taking their medication. So I would say that an independent living, affordable housing complex is probably not the best environment for someone um, with the kinds of diagnoses that you described. Perhaps looking at a shared community living arrangement where that person can get some ongoing support with their, um, with their, their mental health and also 
the ability for someone to monitor their ability to take their medication might be a better situation. That is something that we have struggled with here with some residents who, um, who have mental health issues and are not compliant with their medication. And ultimately, nine times out of 10, it winds up in an eviction situation, which is something that we tried to avoid um, and we try to link them with community mental health services, but it's always a challenge. I would say that, always a challenge. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, just to fill you in on some of the things that have been coming through the chat. Would you agree, um, Maria, Margaret? Yes. I mean, I, I think it's a difficult situation. And as Marilyn indicated, our, there's very long waiting lists in, in senior buildings. It's, it's really very difficult. Um, and I would agree with Marilyn that perhaps another housing environment or housing opportunity would work best for the person. Um, uh, Mar Maria, uh, if I may, Mar Margaret uh, actually uh, uh, responded in the chat as to whether or not Chelsea AL in East Brunswick had been contacted. It's a little bit more expensive, but they may have some sources of funding for this individual. Yeah, and may, if, uh, if I may add, because <clears throat> you're really a part, partner of ours. So when someone has, you know, whether mental health or just behavior expression associated with dementia, um, Alzheimer's, et cetera, uh, the crossings at Chelsea uh, in East Brunswick has been amazing. We have had a phenomenal experience. Unfortunately, they are, you know, double the cost of this because of the individual, um, individual support that they provide and, and everything else. So they, they're really, really successful. Um, but, um, you know, and, and people, uh, people really benefit from it. And it doesn't, yes, it is permanent, but doesn't have to be. We've had, mm -hmm. uh, we've had experience that after some level, perhaps few months, uh, that, that person really stabilized. Uh, because the medication administration was was a lot more inclusive and and better, so th that is very very good. Another resource uh, in Monroe Township is a millennial. Um, it's it's really a um, memory care uh, program, but it's almost like a group home millennial care in uh, in Mar uh, in Monroe Township. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Margaret. Uh uh, we're reaching our time. I just wanted to uh, follow up on something that Marilyn said. And, you know, one of the issues uh, with someone who is a paranoid schizophrenic who's not adherent with medication is, of course, that their um, schizophrenic behaviors return and they're very difficult to manage. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think is probably a a more viable suggestion uh, for this individual is to get her into some kind of community-based board and care home where they do take people like this with mental health problems and see if you can get her to accept attendance at a partial hospitalization program a couple of days a week. That would um, help with some of the management issues. Uh, I know that there are some board and cares that do take people who do have mental health problems. I know I see that I see the residents walking around our neighborhood here where the medical school is, you know, so that is one option, but a partial hospitalization program, which just re requires daily attendance might be a solution. There are nursing homes specifically, not AL facilities, but nursing homes that will take people with mental health problems. Uh, you know, down here, you know, the palace is one of them. Uh, Crystal Lake Manor was another one. Some of them do. If you go onto the Department of Health website, you'll see the ones that take people with mental health problems. But in a case like this, I think a board and care in a community-based setting with some supportive services and linking to a psychiatric partial um, might be the best uh, option. Thank you very much, Elise, for that answer. And I, I think we're going to cut it short right now. We have hit noon. And I want to be mindful of everybody's timing, but we're so glad that you could attend this conference. 
And I thank our speakers, Marilyn, Maria, Elise, and Margaret. Um, we will be providing you with a copy of the slides that you see, uh, a link to the recording that will be posted on our YouTube page, and any documents that the speakers would like to share. Um, and additionally, uh, we will be providing contact information for them if you would like to reach out at any later date and time. So thank you once again for everything, and I hope you thank have you. a lovely day. Everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining Hi. us. Today. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks to our thank speakers. You. Thank, so thank you. Too. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.